Welcome to the Get Better Project, where your host Joe Bauer interviews the world's top fitness, endurance, and strength athletes to figure out what has propelled them to the top of their game. Let's be great. Let's be great. Listen, learn, and start getting better today. Here we go. Hey guys, welcome to the Get Better Project, where in this interview, I am going to be talking with Dave Lipson. Dave Lipson is actually the guy that got me to jump over to CrossFit from doing endurance style sports and just lifting weights in the gym. We were both personal trainers in New York City, and he one day said, hey, you got to try this CrossFit thing. So I gave it a shot and never really looked back. So many years later, we're here today, and I'm excited to interview Dave, who's gone from a professional baseball player to a high-level CrossFit athlete, and then after getting injured, now has headed into the bodybuilding arena. And Dave is a very smart individual, which is why I'm excited to talk with him today about his program Thunderbro and how he got into it and what is the deal with all of this hypertrophy training that he is doing. So basically muscular growth. So without further ado, we're going to jump right into this podcast with Dave Lipson of Thunderbro. Enjoy. Dave Lipson, how's it going, man? Good, man. How are you doing? Thanks for having me on. Yeah, you bet. You bet. It's been a long time since I've actually seen or talked to you. So Man, looking big, looking good. We're getting there. It's a long, long process, but a uh, <laughs> couple, couple pounds every year. Heck yeah, man. I don't, I don't know if you know this, but you were actually the person that motivated me to get into CrossFit way back in New York City. I had no idea. Yeah, man. I'd, I'd been introduced to it before, but I never had actually been pushed over the edge until... Until Big Dave Lipson said you should try this for one last time, and I gave it a shot. So thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. I hope uh, it's been a good journey for you. It's been a great journey, and I think that it's interesting how things continue to evolve, and I'm excited to talk with you today about how things have evolved for you specifically. <sighs> so, man, uh, like, I'm interested, actually, and I think a lot of people having listened to podcasts and following you on Instagram and things like that would love to know where you grew up and like, I think that a lot of people know that you played professional baseball, but like where, first of all, where did you grow up? Um, so I grew up in uh, Norwalk, Connecticut. It's, it's pretty close to New York city. You know, it's like 45 minutes outside the city, typical kind of a uh, tri-state area. Um, my mother, she's a, a school teacher for 35 years. My father is a rabbi. He's been a rabbi now for almost 40 years. And uh, yeah, pretty, pretty great upbringing. A lot of, a lot of good uh, influences and parents, coaches, uh, you know, g- good people to give me, uh, give me guidance as I was, I was growing up. And uh, really, really nice town, Norwalk, like a uh, uh, great community. Play, growing up playing baseball there, like I still talk to some of my old teammates and stuff from like Little League. And um, it, was, it was a fun place to, to grow up. Nice. Does your family still live there? I'm sorry, what's that? Does your family still live there? Yeah, I mean, my, my family is like everyone loves Raymond. Uh, my sister lives like shouting distance from my parents. Uh, they, all, they all do the same thing, work in the same places in the same block. Um, they are very much stationary. And from the time I was 18, although I loved growing up there, I knew I was, I was, I was going to leave and, and probably never come back. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh. And that's what I did. You know, I like left and went to college, and did baseball for a long time, and CrossFit brought me all around the country. I personally, like, uh, I knew that I wanted to live in some places that had uh, scenery and, and actual, like, physical beauty that I'd always dreamed about being around. So we lived out in San Diego for a while. We got to do the beach thing. And now we live out in Colorado and we're out in the mountains. And this is our dream is just to be around some, like, really the raw beauty of the country. Oh man, I, I cannot agree more. I think that being out in the country is is where it's at. Having lived in a van for the last year and a half, how how long did you play professional baseball for? So I played from 
2005 to 2009. Um, and uh, this was like uh, bouncing around the minor leagues quite a bit after my college career was over. Um, you know, I, I played in a couple different organizations all around the country. I, I think I went to almost every single major minor city. Um, so when people are like, oh, I'm from this you know, city in Iowa, I've probably been there once or twice before. Um, that's the beauty of minor league baseball is you travel a lot. Uh, you got a lot of time on the bus to uh, talk to your Dominican teammates or, um, you know, uh, read, read books, watch videos. So I became quite a movie buff because I watched lots of movies on the bus. It was like long 13 hour bus rides um, and did quite a bit of reading. That's where I originally started studying strength and conditioning and, um, you know, studied to get my CSCS just going from city to city on the bus rides, trying to crack away at this like 800 page textbook. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. So what, at what point did baseball end? And then I, you were personal trained for a while before finding CrossFit. And that was uh, in New York city. What then led you into CrossFit? So baseball to personal training to CrossFit. Yeah, I think, um, you know, when you're, when you're an athlete and you, you play the sport for a while and you're lucky enough to play at a high level, what usually ends up happening is like, there's a big part of your identity that's connected to that sport. You know, I remember from the time I was eight years old, I was going to be a baseball player. Like that was it. I was going to be a professional baseball player and that's what I was going to do. And, um, and I was lucky enough to get to play at some of the higher levels and for a really long time. And then when you're done, it's kind of like, uh, if you ever seen the movie Zoolander before, it's like that moment where Zoolander looks in the puddle and he goes like, who, who am I? You know? And, um, I was, I was pretty fortunate that I fell into strength and conditioning before my career was over. I really started getting into it when I had a, an arm injury and a show, uh, a elbow surgery that I, I started learning about it and doing myself and even training some of my teammates in the last couple of years of my career. So I knew that as my career was winding down, I kind of knew I was going to end up as a strength and conditioning coach um, because I just, I recognized that I had a, a bit of a knack for it. You know, I liked doing it myself and I loved showing it to other people. So, um, I was kind of in my last couple of years of being on the fence, whether I was going to go back and play another season when I started training people. And by the time that I was ready to end my career, I had already had a path set where I had a job lined up. I had some really good experience. I had some good mentors to learn from, even training any conditioning coaches that had taught me um, that were going to give me opportunities to continue to kind of learn from them. Um, and that, that you know, eventually turned into a much longer, more fruitful career than my baseball career. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then how long did you personal train before finding CrossFit and going like head over heels into that? I mean, I love, I love personal training. Like that is the tits for me. There's nothing better than getting to work one-on-one -on -one with an athlete, um, getting to actually read them, get to know them on a more personal basis. I think that's, you know, in terms of what I enjoy as a trainer, that's my favorite thing is being a one-on-one. -on -one. I started, I found CrossFit, you know, probably around 2008 where I started kind of dabbling in it and that was group training. And what I did was I just started doing CrossFit with my individual athletes. Um, so I started showing my private clientele, we, you know, we would do some workouts, um, especially in New York where it's kind of hard to run a group of anything. Um, it was easy for me to kind of do that on a one-on-one, -on -one. but then as you know, more and more people wanted to come and train, I, I knew that I was going to eventually have to like get out of that one-on-one -on -one training space and be able to train a group. Um, so we went and uh, we moved to San Diego. We opened up a gym there. We went to Boston. We opened up a gym there. And eventually we landed on online training as the best option um, because, you know, with online training, your gym is kind of limitless and you have a lot of opportunity to share good information with a bunch of people. Oh, heck yeah. So when, when you were in CrossFit and being a competitive CrossFit athlete, at what point did that turn from I can do CrossFit sustainably and then I can't do CrossFit sustainably anymore? I need to look for something different. Yeah, I, th I think that, that can probably be different for everybody. For me, uh, you know, I, I, I probably did what most people do. I, you know, went all in and said, I'm going to be the fittest man on earth and try to, to just, uh, you know, almost beat myself into the ground with the training, probably trained a little irresponsibly. So I wouldn't even say that I was doing CrossFit um, as a competitor. I was just doing a lot of a lot and, uh, 
You know, the CrossFit methodology really is about health and longevity. CrossFit competition is about something else. That's about being, you know, being the fittest on earth. So it's not necessarily um, conducive towards health and longevity. It's conducive towards performance at all costs. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, it was, it was probably um, in 2013 and 14 when my body kind of started breaking down a little bit. I started getting some, you know, back pain and shoulder pain and things that would eventually require surgery. Um, and, uh, you know, it wasn't until I was able to um, completely accept that I could no longer do what I was doing um, to get what I want that my mind started to change on things because I'm very stubborn. I would just hurt myself and go back in the gym and do the same thing and hurt myself and go back in the gym and then feel bad about myself because I couldn't you know, deadlift what I once deadlifted or the spot on the leaderboard wasn't where I wanted it to be. Um, when really at that point, um, those were all goals that had kind of been peer pressured into me by the people around me. And, and what I really wanted was just like, look good and feel good. So uh, after surgery was uh, when I, I really started doing some hard thinking and, and landing it on this idea of, you know, why don't I try to combine performance and aesthetics so that I can keep training the rest of my life and get what I want out of my program. Yeah. And then how did that, like, what, what's the next step? How did that go in or turn into Thunderbro? And where, where did you get this idea of like, I want to study hypertrophy and all this Thunder stuff? Bro, Thunderbro is a funny story. Like, honestly, it's um, the, the hypertrophy thing. Um, I could tell you exactly like where that came from. Um, after back surgery, you're, you're stuck on a couch. It's kind of like being on a desert island. You're there for weeks you can't really move. People got to pick you up to help you pee and you got a lot of time to think. And so I was thinking, you know, when I get out of this situation, because it's miserable, uh, when I get out of here, what am I going to do with my body? Like I, I, I never want to be here again, but when, when I can use my body again, I'm going to appreciate it more and I'm going to use it the way that I want to use it to get what I want out of it. And I started thinking, you know, I, I want to have a goal, like probably competing in CrossFit is not a good goal. That's probably just going to land me back on the operating table. And, you know, same thing with like powerlifting or Olympic lifting. I love strength, but like, you know, those things, it's, it's just not, that's not the path. And I realized that, you know, the first time I ever went into a gym when I was 16 years old and I grabbed a set of dumbbells and doing bicep curls, I was doing it because I wanted to have big arms because I wanted to get chicks. Like that's what everyone does, right? <laughs> And uh, it's because I wanted, I wanted imposing physicality. And, uh, and I you know, realized I'd never really pursued that before. Um, and my rehabilitation was so similar to hypertrophy training or bodybuilding where you're doing slow and controlled movements at submaximal loads, just trying to fortify tissues and connective tissue and muscle to make things bigger and stronger. And I really enjoyed that. I said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really give bodybuilding a go, but I'm going to try to combine it with what I know from fitness. Because I, I, you know, neither one of those, just bodybuilding or just CrossFit, that they're great, but they each have their drawbacks. Um, and I was looking for something sustainable where maybe I could combine performance and aesthetics together. So I started uh, researching a lot of stuff. I connected with uh, a mentor of mine, Dr. Brad Schoenfeld, who's the world's foremost expert on muscle hypertrophy. And uh, he wrote a book called The Science of Muscle Hypertrophy. And he's a very academic guy. He deals with a lot of, you know, scrutinizing a lot of different studies. But from his book that I read and from connecting with him, um, I was able to highlight three different mechanisms that you can use and training factors that correlate with them to be able to get muscles to grow. And all I did was take those theories and try to combine them with functional fitness and, uh, and, and more functional movements to be able to try to get both of those things to happen together. Um, I designed a program for myself where I was going to lift 40% of my one rep max for eight sets of eight reps. And that was going to be how I planned to gain my muscle back after uh, back surgery. And I was shocked at how well it worked. I was like, holy crap, I put on 30 pounds of muscle and I didn't have to go as fast as I could or lift as heavy as I could. Um, and my back feels better. So, um, so I really was intrigued by it. And uh, I went to one, uh, my bosses at the time, Dave Castro and Nicole Carroll, and they were asking Camille and I about designing our own course. And I said, hey, I got the perfect idea for a course. We should do a CrossFit hypertrophy course, all about how you can combine hypertrophy work with CrossFit, that they both immediately shot down and said, no, we can't do that. And that's because you know, there's this stigma about bodybuilding and how it's non-functional. And it's really not even true. It's just mostly people that don't understand what bodybuilding even is. But I said, you know what, let me write an article about what I've learned 
and I'll publish it in the CrossFit Journal, and you guys can read it, and maybe it'll change your mind. So I started writing this article, and it became bigger and bigger and bigger. It just went from page to page to page, and eventually ended up being 100 pages because there's so many layers to hypertrophy. There's understanding you know, the anatomy of muscle fibers and understanding the mechanisms that drive hypertrophy and understanding how to apply that with CrossFit and functional fitness and then all the nutrition and protocols that go around that and the recovery and the strategies. There's just like so many layers to this that it became really robust. And after I'd written 100 pages, I called the CrossFit Journal and said, hey, if I, if I submit this, this article to you, which is really a book, it'd probably be a multi-part article, would you guys own it? Because I've probably invested like hundreds of hours of writing it so far. They said, yeah, we would. And they said, you know what, fuck that. I'm going to publish it myself. And so I got together with one of my good buddies, Andrew Charlesworth, who also at that time was working with me on staff. And we really, I did some hypertrophy workouts with him and he loved it. And we were talking about how cool it would be to kind of combine the two things together, a little bit of CrossFit with some of the bodybuilding so that people don't plateau, but we can help them come out of or avoid injuries, or at the very least, get what they want out of the program. Because like we've been saying, like most people are training because they want to look good and feel good, not because they want to be the fittest man or woman on earth. Um, and uh, we designed this website called Thunderbro, which the idea of, of Thunderbro is basically like I was in a place where uh, I was I was in a, a dark place physically and mentally, like my, my body had deteriorated. Um, my, my, my mind, my heart, everything was, my dick was in the dirt. And I, I was like, I got, I got to make a change. Like I got to find a way to start bringing some thunder. And the best way to do that is with your bros, you know, you <laughs> a group of people, like-minded people that, uh, want to, want to be their best. And we say, you know, in the, in the gym, uh, in, in the home and sport and life and at work, just bring thunder, like find a way to win. Um, and that's what Thunder Bros about is, is finding a way to win um, and feel successful in what you're doing in the gym. So we had this idea. I had this book, Hypertrophy for Functional Fitness, and we decided, why don't we kind of combine it with that program I did, which was my 8x8, 90 Day Get Huge program. And uh, we also had an idea for this like testosterone boosting coffee um, that I was using all these adaptogenic herbs to help raise my testosterone and we both love drinking coffee. He said, what if we did like a pre-workout where it was like a testosterone boosting coffee where people could get all these herbs and their pre-workout drink with some beet powders, like a vasodilator. Um, and we made a Shopify site, made some t-shirts. We designed the books um, and we put a couple grand into it. And I remember being so nervous that, you know, poor Andrew was going to like lose his thousand dollars he put in because <laughs> he's trying to buy a house and he's got two gyms and he's just trying to, trying to like get by and make it all work. And I was like, man, I really hope we make our money back. And we made it back in the first half hour that we were open because what we realized after that first day was that there is an insatiable demand of people just like us who have either hit a plateau or maybe got a little bit stale on the CrossFit competition side of things, especially, or have been beat down so much by injury that they feel like there's no, there's nothing more for them or that this is a dead end that, uh, you know, we've provided a path for them to still be able to thrive um, and show them that there's, there's still more in you. There's still more out there. You can still have the best physique of your life, even if you're broken down. And to be honest, that, that's what most people want when they're training is, is they want to be able to wear that work on their body. So when they walk in a room, people know that they train. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really interesting. And, and in getting ready for this interview, I actually went through and read the the hypertrophy for functional fitness and I've done some of the workouts and I think that's really cool and it is fun and it's harder than I would have expected, which it actually has come back around and helped me for CrossFit workouts. So that is really interesting. Who do you call your ideal clientele when someone asks me, is this right for me? Um, yeah, I mean, like, I think most of our clients are like 25 to 40 year old guys and, and girls. We probably, probably have more guys because, to be honest with you, most guys want to be bigger. You know, like they want to they have that Adonis kind of looking body. So um, a lot of that, but really it's for anybody out there who um, is looking to improve their physique. Anybody out there, especially who's dealing with injury, who feels like they're, you know, they don't know what to do when they go in the gym now, um, especially that 90-day program, which is a program that like you only use 40% of your one rep max the entire program 
And uh, my cousin, who's a lawyer, he doesn't even train. He did the program without me knowing it. And he goes, hey, I did the program and I put on 15 pounds of muscle. And I was like, how did you do that? You don't even know how to squat. <laughs> because the weight's so light that you're able to move and get consistency. And because the tempos are so slow, you're able to really control and feel the movement. While these things are both good for hypertrophy, they're fantastic for orthopedic safety too, because the two things that hurt people are speed and load. You yeah. know, most people when they get hurt, it's because they went too fast or they went too heavy. So, um, so that has a lot of application to anybody out there who's dealing with that stuff. It's also great for people like we have athletes in our program who are former CrossFit Games athletes that have basically hit a point where they're like, I need to do something different. Like I need to rebuild myself. I need to build that foundation up. We call that kind of restructuring their hardware because in CrossFit, so much of the work we're doing is neurological, just learning how to, you know, wire the body to move athletically. But very rarely do we just get to work on fortifying joints and making the machine bigger and stronger. So, um, so the pure hypertrophy work is one way to actually build a very formidable machine that you can then apply with the neurological process you're making by practicing these athletic movements. Totally. Why does the slow movement at 40% actually cause muscle growth? So it's never like one percentage or, or one uh, type of tempo. The, the thing with hypertrophy is that you can elicit it in a lot of different ways. Um, you can elicit it with metabolic stress. That's doing things like accumulating byproducts of exercise, like hydrogen and lactate by using short rest periods. So, you know, for instance, when you get a pump, that's metabolic stress in the muscle. You can do it by changing mechanical loading. So by doing different planes of movements, by working ranges you don't normally work, by working different types of loading like accommodating resistance or different types of weight, you can manipulate the mechanical loading. But the greatest correlate is muscle micro tearing, which is where you're actually breaking down the muscle, specifically the sarcolemma and uh, applying damage to the myosin and actin bonds in the muscle cells that allow it to remodel and regrow thicker. And that's best done with time under tension. So whether it's a three second tempo or a five or a 10, or whether it's 40%, 50 or 60%, doesn't really matter so much as long as you're asking the muscle to do something it's not accommodating to doing and you're able to create that muscular micro tearing. That's why hypertrophy makes you sore. And that's why when we do our training splits, there's so much time between muscle groups because if you do damage to the muscle and you don't let it recover, not only don't your hormones completely recover, but the tissue won't recover and you won't grow as much. In fact, that could be really inhibit the amount of growth is training too much. Yeah, absolutely. And something interesting that I've noticed is that having done the program for a few weeks and then going and doing CrossFit training, like let's say, you know, uh, five, five rounds of 15 thrusters and pull-ups or something like that, the thrusters are actually feeling easier than they would have prior to doing your program. What is that correlation? Do you Have you identified that? You know, there's no real way to know exactly like what what is going on specifically we know that there are certain things that occur like the thickening of tissue right so the thickening of muscle tissue the thickening of connective tissue we do know that by having muscles remodel thicker and stronger they have an increased contractile potential now so if you're really good at wiring your brain your muscles now you've basically got more to work with so you know it, it the carryover of hypertrophy has a, a tremendous spillover into just general absolute strength because you have you know a stronger machine to then apply your mental capacity to yeah. Awesome. Very cool. How do you guys uh, tackle diet and nutrition? You know, diet and nutrition are pretty contextual to the, the adaptations you want. Most people, when they ask us about diet and nutrition, they're trying to gain size. Sure. And there's some general principles you need to think about when it comes to, to putting on muscle with regard to nutrition and being in what we call an anabolic state. So there are two different states you can generally be in if we're kind of contrasting these two. Anabolism signals growth in the body, so increased muscle size, uptake of nutrients. Uh, catabolism is the opposite. It's the mobilization of energy, it's the reduction of mass, and it's the wasting of muscle. So the idea with muscle growth is to obviously spend more time in an anabolic state, which is more conducive towards helping you get bigger and stronger. An easy way to do that is making sure that first you're in a caloric surplus, which means that you're eating more food than your bar body currently needs to sustain its, its mass. 
So you're eating, you're, you're eating more food than your body needs to be at its, its, its weight right now. Um, and you can calculate that a number of ways, but a generally safe starting point is 20 calories per pound of body weight. That puts most people in a caloric deficit where it's not so extreme that they're just going to be putting on sloppy body fat. But it's, it's enough that like, you know, maybe a pound or two a week is a good steady goal. And the same thing what we're going to do uh, in January, we're talking about cutting. It's the same thing as like being, being in a fasted state where you can balance the anabolic signal with the catabolic ones. You spend most of the day trying to be in a fat mobilizing state and then feed around training so that you're anabolic when you're lifting weights and creating those anabolic signals. Um, protein is also really important. You know, proteins are the building blocks of muscle. It's really important if you are going to be damaging, breaking down muscle and trying to rebuild it, you need to have what we call a positive nitrogen balance, which means that you have a surplus of protein to be able to heal, remodel, and regrow muscle. And a safe place to start with that is about a gram of protein per pound of body weight per day. So, you know, if I'm 200 pounds, I should be eating at least 200 grams of protein to be in a positive nitrogen balance. So calories and protein are probably the two biggest factors. The other factors that are ancillary to that, but also very important, are things like sleep. So having good sleep quality where most hormone production, especially anabolic production of thyroid, growth hormone, testosterone, all that stuff recovers at night. So um, having a good amount of deep sleep is important to become anabolic. And then just general stress outside of training. The body doesn't make any distinctions between the type of stress it has. It's not like this is good stress and this is bad stress. So when you go in the gym, you're stressing yourself. So if you can reduce that stress outside the gym by things like meditation, quiet, or just kind of turning your brain off a little bit, that can also be very anabolic as well. Yeah, very cool. Great stuff. Great stuff for sure. What are your current goals? So... Um, I mean, I have a lot of goals. My biggest one is just continuing to build Thunderbro and spread this information out and give people good resources and good products. Our community has grown tremendously where now we have our menu, our library of training books. We also have a thriving online community and our Muscle Anarchy online program. Uh, we have Thunderbro University coming out where it's going to be an educational platform talking about all the stuff that we're talking about. Um, we, have, we have seminars events, cruises, and then all of our cool Thunder merchandise is just kind of like products that support the lifestyle. So uh, we're growing tremendously. That's number one. Uh, personally and for credibility, my goal is to now progress as a bodybuilder to the next level um, because, you know, I I've, I've just started competing in the sport and uh, a lot of people were very apprehensive because I was the CrossFitter, the new guy on the scene, um, and now I'm starting to establish myself I've qualified for nationals in every single bodybuilding category. And, you know, I think a great goal for the next year is to compete at nationals and try to do well. And the ultimate would be to get a pro card, which is just like the, the, the highest level of credibility you can get as a bodybuilder outside of like winning the Olympia. Everybody wants a pro card. So they know you're legit um, if, you, if you win a national show. Um, and that takes a tremendous amount of work and investment. But from what I'm doing, it, it, it leverages really well against the business because not only do I get to kind of show what that journey looks like and try to be a model or a guinea pig for our programs, but it, it gives a level of credibility instead of just saying you do bodybuilding to actually have done it means a lot more and it gives you a level of knowledge that you can't get any other way. Yeah, man. What, what do you think that looks like for you to continue in bodybuilding? You know, how, how big is Dave Lipson going to be? Well, so it depends on what category you're competing in. Uh, bodybuilding, the men's side of things, has three categories. There's physique. That's where you see the guys who wear the board shorts. Those are probably the smallest bodybuilding athletes. They only get graded on the upper body. At the pro level, they're, they're pretty big dudes. But as you move to categories like classic physique, where now you're looking at a model that's, that has a height and a weight standard based on the model of kind of the golden age of bodybuilding, like Arnold Schwarzenegger's dimension, six foot two, 242 pounds on stage. Um, that, that is a, a middle ground category. And then bodybuilding has no weight or height limit. That's why you see the guys who get really, really big. I personally really like classic physique and bodybuilding because I love training legs and there's a lot more layers to it. Um, but to be able to qualify in all three of those was very important to me because it shows versatility. Most people who compete, they'll compete in a single category. And I think it's such a CrossFit thing to do to try to compete in every category, right? Like <laughs> I want to be the power lifter and the endurance athlete. Um, so yeah, nationals next year. I think I have a good shot at that uh, 225 bodybuilding class and you know the higher level you get to the more extreme everything gets so the, 
the training protocols, the nutrition protocols, the preparation, at, you know, at just like CrossFit, like it just requires more and more. That's why I know I'm probably never going to be like just a pro bodybuilder. That's not the goal. The goal is, is to have the knowledge and experience to be able to get somebody there. If one of our athletes, and we have so many athletes who are now getting ready for their first show, you know, like in our muscle anarchy group, they, they, they seen as I chronicled what I've been doing and we're providing them kind of like a user friendly idiot's guide to doing your first show and what you need to know and how to do it. Um, that's the goal with all this. That, that is very cool, man. What, how, <laughs> how would you explain your cutting without cardio? <laughs> I know there's a big topic. <laughs> cutting without cardio. Yeah. Originally, this idea didn't come from me by any means. It came from one of my good friends, Stan Efferding, who is known as the world's strongest bodybuilder. So he was a professional power lifter and a professional bodybuilder at the same time. The guy's got like a 900-pound squat. Um, and he's an absolute beast. What I love about him is it's the same idea. He likes to combine performance and aesthetics. He, d- he doesn't believe you should just be just a display model only, but you should be able to use your size and use your strength and be able to do stuff well. So I was immediately kind of attracted to that, but Stan is such a great, knowledgeable guy. And before I was getting ready for my first show, he said, hey, listen, man, don't do cardio. I said, <laughs> what do you mean? He goes, it's called bodybuilding, not body shrinking. You don't need to do cardio. What you need to do is you need to increase your training frequency. So you need to increase the volume of your training, train more throughout the day. So instead of doing one session, split it up into two or three smaller sessions. And you need to be in a caloric deficit so that you're going to be burning and pulling fat instead of just ripping, ripping through muscle. So a lot of that is nutrition protocols around that where you'll spend a good amount of the day in a fasted state. But then around your strength training, you feed. So you're able to balance the catabolic signals where you're actually pulling out of fat stores with the anabolic signals where you're trying to preserve as much muscle and stimulate hormones. Wow. That's cool stuff. What does an, what does an actual training day look like in that phase? So with Thundercuts, it's pretty simple. You know, you wake up in the morning, you immediately take a shake. It's a low calorie, low carbohydrate shake just to kind of refeed and replenish your nitrogen, uh, your nitrogen balance. Then you go through what we call a depletion workout, which is a light, uh, a light workout with light weight that's short. It's like a 30 minute recovery workout where you're just moving blood around, but you're trying to pull fat stores kind of similar to CrossFit, but with lower intensity and more stress on specific muscles. Um, so, uh, uh, very similar to that really similar to kind of some of the stuff we do with our 10 minute hypertrophy finishers, where you're just going to pump muscles. You're going to get a good pump. You're going to move blood around and you're going to start firing up your metabolism. After that, we have athletes take a coffee with MCT oil to help stave off the hunger until 1 p.m. And then at 1 p.m., you start feeding with the intention of training at 5. So most of your meals occur in a six-hour window around your, your strength training session at night, and then that cycle repeats the next day. So the first half of the day is, is in a caloric deficit in a widely fasted state. In the second half of the day, you're eating and you're training heavy. And you're still in a caloric deficit when you add up all the numbers is that you strategically place the food and the training in a way that you're not just going to be having muscle fall off of you. Very interesting. And then what is the, what's the opposite? Like when you're in a gaining cycle, how does the day look? So the gaining cycle, like I said, it it would be the opposite is a caloric surplus. So less training and more food. Um, You know, like the actually, you know, people are so addicted to training and I tell them, if you're trying to gain muscle, my greatest period of muscle growth was when I was training three days a week, just three workouts a week, and it would be leg day, chest day, and back day. And we would hit it for like 90 minutes or two hours, and we would demolish those muscles, but then all we would do is eat and sleep and recover between, and that's the most anabolic thing you can do. So, you know, more isn't better, better is better, and better is just defined by growth when it comes to hypertrophy. Yep, absolutely. How do you tackle how do you tackle the age question? Like what is as, the age question? <laughs> le, like how people are getting older and how long they can continue to, to develop. I know I get it a lot and I hear a lot of people, family and friends even that are like, Man, I'm getting old. I can't do that anymore. How do you tackle that? Well, that's kind of like a question of like the general adaptation syndrome, right? So this general adaptation syndrome is a theory by a guy named Dr. Hans Seal. He put it out in the early nineteen hundreds. He said, hey, you know what? Organisms adapt to the stress you place upon it, but eventually they're going to accommodate. So eventually, if you keep doing the same thing, you're going to plateau. And in some cases, you can even regress or get injured. 
So you need to keep changing the stimulus. What worked for you when you were 25 might not work for you when you're 50. Part of that is like figuring it out, figuring out the nutrition, the training protocols. But most importantly, I think the idea of variety allows the opportunity to find what those paths look like. Because my training continues to evolve and it should be a large progression. And like I said, if three days a week gives you more results than five days a week, why would you train five days a week? Right. I mean, like if you name it, you know, a guy who's like, you know, like, hey, I'm getting older. You say, all you got to do is train three days a week. That'll give you the results that you want. Like, I don't understand why people wouldn't adopt that because they just really want to train. They just really want to go in the gym and they're very stubborn. They just want to keep doing the same thing. So I think, you know, to answer your question, you need to keep evolving. Okay. What do the older, older end of people in your program? I'm sorry. What's that? What are, the, what are the older people in your program? Like how old are you training people? In I mean, program? we have some people I'd say in their 50s in some of our programs, so the Get Huge program, the Muscle Anarchy program. <coughs> I don't have any 60 or 70-year-olds, but um, you know, the, the way that would change, the biggest factor would be recovery because that's what really gets inhibited. So they, they can potentially need more recovery. Another thing they can need sometimes is manipulating the amount of protein because their ability to absorb protein changes a little bit as you get older. So kind of finely tuning the nitrogen balance and the calories to where you need it is another thing that you need to keep kind of looking at and evolving as you age. Cool. What are the hardest things about training for you? Um, I mean, there, there are lots of hard things about it for me. Um, I think... The most enjoyable part of training for me is building muscle. I love lifting. I love eating. Um, I love sleeping, right? That's a fun thing. What's not as fun for me is the cutting. I don't like being hungry. I don't like forcing myself to train when I'm tired. Um, and even the posing in the sport of bodybuilding, that's probably my biggest area to grow is spending the time in front of the mirror trying to connect with muscles. That's not fun for me. But, you know, to progress in the sport, that's what, that's, that's my biggest area. That's my weakness, right? You say like work on your weakness in CrossFit. Well, that's my weakness is like spending time in front of the mirror, trying to be able to show the work that I've put in. Because what's, what's interesting in bodybuilding is like, you're not graded on one thing. You're grading ba basically on three things. You have size and symmetry. That's how big you are and how symmetrically you are top to bottom and side to side. Uh, you have definition, so how well you can actually see the muscle in terms of the, the striation of the muscle, the vascularity, or your leanness, how, how thin your skin is. And then there's posing, your ability to show it. And there may be somebody who doesn't have your same size and symmetry or definition who can beat you because they can pose better. So posing is a really important part. I mean, it's a third of your score. So, uh, you know, that, that's a big area that I'm working on. Cool. What do, what do you do for fun outside of the gym? Um, so, I mean, I, I love, I love being outside. I love hanging out with the dogs, but my favorite thing is going to restaurants and crushing food. I love, <laughs> I love eating. It's, it's like, especially right now after the show, um, you're insatiably hungry. So I've been like hitting different pancake houses all around the state. I'm like researching <laughs> menus, like, Hey, we go to this place. And it's crazy because Camille's on a diet. So she hates me because I'm researching who's got the best brunch in, in Colorado. Um, but that's really fun to me. And especially um, doing that around training. So I like to train with lots of people. I follow the Muscle Anarchy program. And at my gym, I have a group of sometimes almost 10 dudes who come in and train with me and do the program. And we'll go and we'll smash, we'll smash the training in the gym. And then all together, we'll go out and eat and eat food. And that to me is like the funnest thing is like being <laughs> with friends and just having a good time. Um, I love that. That's the best. That's awesome. What gym do you train at? I go to Armbrust Pro Gym in Denver and I train out of my garage. Oh, cool. Um, my garage gym is getting better and better. We're starting to acquire more and more equipment. And the goal is to, you know, eventually just have everybody come up to the house and training there and then doing like a big barbecue up there. Um, but, but friends, family, and community is my favorite, you know, and, and being able to share that with my wife, you know, Camille's just stepped away from competition this past year. So she started to get into a lot of the hypertrophy bodybuilding stuff and aesthetics for her because she's marketing programs that involve aesthetics. And her journey is almost paralleling mine, but on the female side. Uh, she's never going to compete in bodybuilding, but she wants to look really good, uh, like a lot of people do. So she's starting to gain some knowledge on that side, too. And we have so many good people around us who have done it at such a high level that we were constantly learning. Um, and we love sharing that information with our communities. That's awesome. Where do you see Thunderbro going in the next five years? 
So th the goal now is to continue to expand the programs in the community. I would love for us to be in gyms around the country, especially non-CrossFit gyms. Like I love seeing people wearing Thunderbird t-shirts at 24-hour fitness um, because we do more functional stuff. Um, and I would also love to have an affiliate program that CrossFit gyms can run as a specialty class doing the Thunderbird program. Uh, cause I think that would be really huge. So we're starting to kind of establish that Thunderbro university is coming out. That's our educational platform. I could see us down the road, just continuing to build out all the current pillars we have with training, education, and merchandise. Very cool. If people want to get involved with some of this stuff that you're doing, where would you send them? So we actually have an ambassador program. Um, and a lot of our, uh, a lot of our athletes, especially the ones doing our online programs, it, you know, they really love being a part of the community. They get to actually share that stuff with people and benefit from it. So uh, we've set up an ambassador program that's doing really well. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, what was the question one more time? How can people find out more about getting started with Thunderbro? Oh, yeah. Um, if you go to thunderbro.com, that's T-H-U-N-D-R-B-R-O.com. It's just thunder with no E. We say thun Dr. Bro because <laughs> it's bro science, <laughs> real science. Um, all of our programs and gear and all that stuff is right there. On social media, at Thunderbro, same spelling, T-H-U-N-D-R-B-R-O, or at Dave Freakin' Lipson. The links in both of our bios go to all of our products and uh, merchandise and programs and stuff like that. So it's pretty accessible there. Um, even our YouTube channel, like we're building our YouTube channel and doing an extensive series on um, bodybuilding competitions and what people can expect if they're doing their first one or all the things that go into it. And just the Thunderbro community in general. Um, we've been running these 90-day Get Huge challenges. We just love seeing people putting on size and giving out prizes for it. So yeah, all, all that stuff is out there. Just, just find us on social or go to thunderbro.com. Very cool. And how do you help people decide once they're at thunderbro.com, what direction to take? So if you go to the link on the training programs, there's a description for each training program that kind of shows you like what it is and, and who it's for and how to do it. Um, you know, there's lots of different ways to do this. Like we have pure hypertrophy programs, like our 90 day. We have hybrid programs that combine hypertrophy with CrossFit, like Muscle Anarchy. Um, we have our book of 100 10 minute hypertrophy finishers, which are short workouts you can do after your own affiliate programming. Uh, we have our shredded at home program, which is like a 40 minute dumbbell only program at, at home. Uh, we have our, our 90 day get huge challenge. Um, and we have Thundercuts coming out January 1st. So depending on who you are, like what your goal is and how fast you want to get that goal um, would kind of filter you into a specific program. Also like the logistics that you're working with, whether you're training in the Globo gym or a CrossFit gym or at home, how much time you have um, and how deep you want to dedicate yourself to hypertrophy. Cool, Dave. I mean, all this stuff sounds really great. I think it's awesome what you're doing with uh, not only just the pure bodybuilding stuff, but how you're helping CrossFitters stay healthier and get better at CrossFit. So there's nothing that makes me happier than getting an email or a message from someone who, you know, has my same stories. Like, you know, I, I felt defeated. My dick was in the dirt. I thought this is it for me. I'm never gonna be able to train anymore. And then I did the program and now I'm pain free or I'm looking better than I ever have. My deadlift has gone up and my shoulder doesn't hurt anymore. And that stuff is golden. So, um, you know, as long as that continues to occur, we're going to keep showing up and, and fighting for our community and our athletes to bring them the very best we can. Cool, man. Well, I think it's awesome. Fully supportive of it. And, uh, I really appreciate your time being on the podcast here. So if there's anything else we can do for you, always let us know. Thanks dude. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, you bet. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, man. Later. Hey, guys. That was my interview with Dave Lipson of Thunderbro, spelled T-H-U-N-D-R-B-R-O. If you're looking for any of his programs, I do highly recommend him. Dave is a very smart individual, if you didn't catch that. Um, he not only is smart, but he gets results, and he's just a fun guy to talk to. So I've been doing some of his programs for the last few weeks and have noticed that not only have they helped me to feel like I'm putting on more muscle mass, but also with my CrossFit workouts. Like I mentioned, the workouts where you have a high amount of time under tension just seem to be feeling easier. Like when I'm in the middle of them, I'm just not feeling as beat up as like fatigued as I would usually feel. So if you're looking for an addition to your CrossFit programming or you just want to get bigger in your CrossFit program or you want to be a bodybuilder, I would recommend Thunderbro. I know that I played around bodybuilding for years when I was in college and there was never any real good science behind it. It always felt like you were going and testing things out and seeing what happened. And with this 
Dave has put something together that seems to be based way more on science and you just simply follow the program that he is putting together and you will start to see results. So I cannot say much more about, about it, but recommending the Thunderbow program and Dave Lipson as a person. So like I said, you can head over to T-H-U-N-D-R bro on Google, on Instagram, I probably on Facebook, probably all around the internet, YouTube, and you can get started today. I believe that he even has a a free get started program, or you can go in like I did by the 90 day get huge program and start implementing that into your CrossFit or your daily training schedule. So thunderbro.com, highly recommend it. Cool guys. Hope you enjoyed this. Uh, make sure that you like subscribe and review the podcast so that we can get it out to more people. We'd appreciate that. And we'll see you on the next one. Thank you for listening to the Get Better Project, Get Better Project. hosted by Joe Bauer. If you'd like to leave us a podcast review, head over to the Get Better Project.com slash iTunes. Now get going and take action on something that will make you better today. Better today.